bells, Batman smells, Robin laid an egg. The Batmobile lost the wheel, and the Joker got away. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wade's Movie World. Okay, today is a very special video. Today is a tribute video to my fellow YouTubers and movie fanatics, the Bro Force Squad. And they are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching movies and enjoying discussion about movies and TV and all sorts of things like that. Uh, they have been huge supporters of mine on YouTube and I have been supporters of them and I love their content. Um, and I just felt like with this Thanksgiving season and Christmas around the corner, I would do a tribute video to them because I enjoy their content so much and I enjoy uh, what they have to say about movies and uh, just, you know, I'm a big movie fanatic myself and I hope one day to meet them and uh, maybe do some collaborations with them, uh, whether it be on Wade's Movie World or the Bro Force Squad YouTube channels. So with that said, let me introduce you to the Bro Force Squad. We have the mad scientist Brian Banner. We have the enforcer Matt Geiger. The Mayor, Jeff Hornacek, The American Hero, Nate Thurmond, and Ronnie Cycli, who is the legal counsel for the group. And uh, so, yeah, they are just a bunch of bros drinking beer, watching movies, and having a good time. Some of their videos they do uh, involve uh, talking about different things at different times, and they separate these things into three different segments or categories. They have the chest day, the protein shake, and do you even lift? And so they always start out with chest day. And so that's what we're going to start out with for the Wade's Movie World version of the Bro Force Squad playbook is my chest day. My chest day topic for today is going to be movies that killed their franchises. Now, I'm going to start off with movies that I don't think necessarily killed their franchises that other people might think did. Uh, but I enjoy these five movies or uh, there's a few more than five here. Uh, but the main five are the ones that I'm going to be talking about. And so I'm just going to get started talking about these. The ones that, you know, people, a lot of people in society may think killed the franchises, but they may have hurt the franchises, but I don't think they necessarily killed the franchises. To start off with, I'm going to start off with the 1993 blockbuster Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. So in 1990, we had uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the movie, and then we had the follow-up Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, and then we had the third in the trilogy, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, where they go back in time to ancient Japan, uh, to help stop a war and also to rescue April. So, was it the best of the three? No, the first movie and the second movie were both uh, pretty similar. I thought the first movie was probably the best one. Um, but uh, I like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Uh, it's kind of corny and campy compared to the first two, but I liked it for what it was. I don't necessarily think that it killed the franchise, but I don't think it helped it any as well. Um, but, you know, there are people out there who like it. There are people out there who hate it. And I'm not one of the haters. So, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Next, I have Ghostbusters 2, which came out in 1989. A lot of people did not like the sequel, Ghostbusters 2. I thought it was just as great as the first one. Uh, there could have been a few things better about it. Um... But uh, overall, I loved the story. I loved that they brought back all the characters. Um, I liked the antagonist, uh, Vigo the Carpathian. Um, you know, uh, one thing I really loved about Ghostbusters 2 uh, was the score music by Randy Edelman. Um, and I was hoping they would use some of that score in the video game that came out in 2011. Uh, but they didn't. They used mainly the Elmer Bernstein score music. I hope for Ghostbusters Afterlife, they use a combination of the Elmer Bernstein score music and the Randy Edelman score music. Uh, that would just be great because I don't think the Ghostbusters 2 score 
gets the recognition it deserves. So, Ghostbusters 2, I do not think killed its franchise. I thought it was a great sequel. Okay, next we have Iron Man 3. A lot of people said they didn't like Iron Man 3. I was one of those. There are things I like about it, but there are things I hate about it. Could it have been better? Yes. Uh, one thing I liked about it, I loved the Air Force One sequence where uh, the people, you know, the when the plane gets uh, a hole blown in the side of it and people fly out and then Tony Stark, uh, Iron Man has to rescue those people as they're falling to the ground. Uh, I really liked that scene or sequence in the movie. Uh, the whole Mandarin sequence uh, with the guy, the guy, the actor, I thought that was just too corny. I thought that could have been done uh, much better. Um, yeah, I mean, there are things about it I like, things about it I don't like. Uh, like Ghostbusters 2, I loved the score of Iron Man 3. If they use, if they do another Iron Man, that's the score they need to keep and use for Iron Man uh, is the one done in that movie. So Iron Man 3, it didn't help the Iron Man movies, but it didn't kill the Iron Man franchise either. Then we have Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. A lot of people in this world hate this Indiana Jones movie. I, for one, liked it. Was it as good as the first three? No. But, uh, you know, I thought it was great for what it was. You know, it brought back that sense of adventure that we got in the first three, uh, even though it dealt with aliens or interdimensional beings, uh, so to speak. I love that they brought uh, Karen Allen's character, Marion Ravenwood, back. Shia LaBeouf's character was just stupid and could have been left out. And of course, they brought back the classic uh, score music done by John Williams. And Steven Spielberg directed the movie. And I believe George Lucas produced or something like that. Yeah, they just got the team back together. It could have been a lot better than what it was, but I don't think it necessarily hurt Indiana Jones any. But that's my feelings on the matter. And then we have the Has Fallen with the three movies, Olympus Has Fallen, London Has Fallen, and Angel Has Fallen. I loved Olympus Has Fallen. I thought London Has Fallen was just as good. Um, I don't think it was better than Olympus, but I thought it was up there with it, so to speak. Angel Has Fallen, there are things I liked about it, and then there are things I didn't like about it. I don't think Angel Has Fallen killed the franchise, but I don't know if it helped it any either. Uh, but I like all three movies, but if I had to choose the best movie out of those three, it would pro probably be Olympus Has Fallen. And those are the movies that I did not think killed their franchises. Now, they may not have helped the franchises very much, but they didn't kill the franchise. Now, let's get into the movies that I think did kill their franchise. And the first one we're going to start with is one that is very divided. You got people who love it and you got people who just flat out hate it and trash it. And I'm on the side of I hate this fucking movie. Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Ryan Johnson, he just did not care. He pretty much just took a shit on Star Wars and all those characters and... He made Star Wars fans like myself very, very angry. And if he still gets his own trilogy, I will not be supporting Disney or Star Wars anymore. But I hope after the fallout from The Last Jedi that he will not be uh, directing any more Star Wars movies because that was a major blow to the Star Wars universe and to its fans. And Kathleen Kennedy, shame on you. And uh, both Ryan Johnson and yourself should be fired. As far as Star Wars is concerned, I love the original three. I love the prequels just as much as the original three. I liked The Force Awakens. I hated, like I said, The Last Jedi. The Rise of Skywalker, there are things I like about it and things I hate about it. The Last Jedi pretty much killed Star Wars for me, at least for the time being. Next, this is really hard because there's three movies that kind of killed this franchise, whichever way you look at it. Halloween 3, you know, you had John Carpenter's Halloween, and then you had Halloween 2, and then 
I thought Halloween 3, since it didn't follow up with Michael Myers, I thought pretty much just ended Halloween right then and there. And then they came back with Halloween 4, which I thought really redeemed the series. Then came Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. That movie pretty much killed the franchise again. I mean, that should have been the nail in the coffin for Michael Myers because I, I didn't see how they could come back from that mess. The story sucked. The only two good things about that movie were Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis and Danielle Harris as Jamie Lloyd once again. Then we had a few more Halloween movies come out. And then in 2002, we got Halloween Resurrection, which was another Halloween movie that pretty much killed off the original franchise. I mean, poor acting, poor story, Busta Rhymes trying to fight Michael Myers using Kung Fu he learned from television. I mean, give me a break. And then you got Busta Rhymes again telling Michael Myers off and then Michael walking away. I mean, really? What a slap in the face to us fans. Then we have the Friday the 13th movies. I liked Friday the 13th parts 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, 5 is okay, but I'm not going to really talk about 5. 6, I absolutely loved. That's kind of like a fan favorite film. And then after 6, I just thought every film after that, except for 1, pretty much made Jason just laughable, irrelevant, stupid. And the movies were just... They were horrible. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. Then we had Friday the 13th, Jason Takes Manhattan, which last 13 minutes of the film is Jason in Manhattan. The rest of it takes place on a boat, which somehow goes from Crystal Lake to the Atlantic Ocean. How that happened, I don't know. And then we have Friday the 13th, Part 9, Jason Goes to Hell. And yeah, it went to hell in a handbasket in that one, that's for sure. There is one after that that I do like and that is Jason X. I just love that movie. Uh, I just thought it was a fun outer space movie uh, that brought Jason Voorhees into the mix and it's just a fun popcorn movie uh, I'd like to watch on a rainy day or something. Is the story great? No. Is the acting great? No. Are the special effects great? No. But uh, it's it's just fun. That's, that's what I'll call it. It's it's fun. So, yeah. Then we go back to Halloween. Halloween was started, or not, not started over, but rebooted, to, uh, so to speak, by Rob Zombie. And he did a fairly good first remake of the first Halloween that John Carpenter did. It wasn't necessarily a shot-for-shot -shot remake. He kind of brought some of his own things into it, which one or two things he should have just not done at all and left out. But overall, the movie's okay. And then he, Rob Zombie came back and did his version of Halloween 2, and that one pretty much just killed off any hope that this new franchise of Halloween had. Halloween 2, Rob Zombie's... Oh my gosh, it was horrible it was gross it was it was just a bad movie i mean i don't know what else to say it was just downright bad and um just white trash is all it was that's all i can say next we go to nightmare on elm street now i like most of the nightmare on elm street films i even like the 2010 remake that they did with Jackie Earl Haley as Freddy. I thought he did a wonderful portrayal of Freddy, and he didn't necessarily copy Robert Englund. He kind of brought his own thing to the role of Freddy Krueger. The film in the Nightmare series that pretty much killed that franchise off was A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 6, Freddy's Dead. It was boring. The story was just lacking everything. The only actor who gave something to his performance was Yafet Kodo, and we all know him as Parker from the first Alien movie. I thought he was the only one who actually brought his character to life. All the other characters are just cardboard cutout characters who you really don't give a flying flip about. 
And then Freddie having a daughter and all this. I mean, it was just, uh, the, you know, it was just dead from from scene one. Uh, I didn't enjoy it at all. In fact, it's probably the worst in the series. So, yep, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 6, Freddy's Dead, killed its franchise. Okay, now we go into the superhero genre. And you all probably know what movie I'm about to mention that killed its franchise. In 1997, George Clooney, Chris O'Donnell, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Uma Thurman, and Alicia Silverstone in Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin. This film pretty much killed any validity Batman had after Batman Forever, which Batman Forever wasn't a bad film, uh, there could have been some things better about it, and I heard that it was a lot darker than what we originally got. Uh, maybe there's a Schumacher cut out there somewhere that we'll get one day, but Batman and Robin, all it was was a two-hour-long toy commercial, and yeah, some of the worst acting I've seen in quite a while, even by someone as good as Arnold Schwarzenegger, and um, yeah. Uh, I'm not even going to get into Batman and Robin. Next, we have the Terminator franchise. A lot of people said that they did not like Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. I actually did. I didn't think that movie hurt the franchise. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who don't like it. I don't love it. I like it. I think it's a worthy sequel. The last three, Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis... And especially Terminator Dark Fate. I mean, you can just pick your poison on those because each of those three killed the Terminator franchise, I think. Which one's the worst? Probably Terminator Dark Fate is the worst. Salvation was something different, uh, which I give them credit for and what they were trying to accomplish and do and the story they were trying to tell. Genesis was just... Eh. Yeah, Arnold was the best thing about that film. Everything else was just, eh. But, uh, yeah, you can pick your poison on which movie killed the Terminator franchise. But uh, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, I did not think killed it. But these other three, uh, yeah. All right, let's go back to the horror genre for a little bit. And how about that killer doll who... Uh, can transport his soul into uh, anyone or a doll, a good guy doll. Chucky, Charles Lee Ray, Brad Dorif. Loved Child's Play, loved Child's Play 2. I thought Child's Play 2 could have been better. And I heard uh, there was some things that were cut out of it and that it was supposed to be a little bit different than what it was. Child's Play 3. Not the greatest movie, but uh, I liked it for what they were trying to do. Bride of Chucky was different, and I liked it. After Bride of Chucky is where things kind of started going downhill for me. Seed of Chucky was just weird, and had some weird scenes, weird imagery. Uh, the story they were trying to tell was just... I don't know, it lost me at times, and I just thought it was not funny, and parts of it were gross. I just, I, I hated Seed of Chucky, and I think Seed of Chucky killed it, this franchise. Or, if you want to go even further down the road, after Seed of Chucky came uh, The Curse of Chucky, which I liked, and I thought was trying to put Chucky back online to you know, the, the darker tone that we started out with in Child Play in 1988. Then after that, they decided to go further and create Cult of Chucky. I'm not even going to say anything except that movie should have never been made. Probably the worst sequel since Seed of Chucky. So, like Terminator, you can pick your poison on which... Uh, movie killed the Chucky franchise. Uh, I did like the the uh, 2019 remake of Child's Play. I thought it was brilliantly done, well executed. 
Uh, I've done a movie review on it, so if you want to see what I have to say about it, go check out my movie review for that. Staying in the horror genre, we have three of the best movies to help put horror back in the spotlight, starting in 1996 with Wes Craven's Scream. And that movie is the movie that actually introduced me to horror movies, was the first Scream movie. And then I got hooked on uh, the Halloween movies, then the Jason movies, then the Freddy movies, then the Chucky movies, and uh, Leatherface, and uh, all those characters. But uh, Scream was actually the one that got me interested in horror movies. Loved Scream. Scream 2 was just as good. Loved Scream 3. I thought it topped the first two movies and went above and beyond uh, where people thought it would go. Then came the one that crashed it, Scream 4. Did not like Scream 4. The only good thing about Scream 4 was how Sydney killed the killer in the end in the hospital. Won't spoil it for you if you have not seen Scream 4, but uh, yeah, that was the only good scene of that movie. Scream 4 killed the Scream franchise for me. How about some Transformers? I liked the first Transformers in 2007. Then we got uh, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, then Transformers Dark of the Moon, then Transformers Age of Extinction. And all of those were okay, but the first Transformers from 2007 was the best. And the worst came out a few years ago, Transformers 5, The Last Night. Uh, they should have just stopped at Transformers 4 because the last night was, it had a couple of good scenes in it, but overall it was just terrible. So they, they just need to stop with the Transformers films for a while and uh, maybe reboot it, you know, in a couple of years or a couple of decades, let it rest for a little while. But yeah, Transformers 5 pretty much killed that, that series of movies. How about some shark movies? We all love the definitive, the number one shark movie in the world, Jaws, and I'm the same way. Love that film. I thought Jaws 2 was a formidable sequel, and uh, it kept the tone of the first film. But then, after that, I just think it kind of lost steam. They didn't really know where to go with it. Jaws 3 and Jaws the Revenge came out, and you can pick your poison with those. Jaws 3 did not help it. It was an okay movie by itself, uh, but attached to the Jaws films, no, nah, it's not really all that great. And then came Jaws the Revenge. Um, I like bits and pieces of that film, but as a Jaws film, no, it, it just, you know, <clears throat> pick your poison with those because it pretty much... Either one of those, you could say, killed the franchise. How about some uh, Marvel movies? And not Marvel as in Marvel Cinematic Universe, but Marvel as in Marvel attached to 20th Century Fox. X-Men 3, The Last Stand, and X-Men Dark Phoenix. Need I say more? I mean, there were parts of those films that were good, but... Those two movies did not help their franchise, and I think, you know, as soon as Dark Phoenix was done anyway, uh, 20th Century Fox was being sold to Disney, and so they, they're they pretty much going to stop with that one, and uh, they should have stopped with X-Men Apocalypse, because uh, for one thing, the Dark Phoenix story had already kind of been done, in X-Men 3 The Last Stand, which we already got back in 2006. And why do we need another story based on those same events and same characters? Well, we really don't. I hope the Bro Horse Squad doesn't get mad at me. I've seen this movie. It's a fun movie, but did it help the franchise? No, I think it just kind of tanked it. Uh, I listened to one of their... Uh, commentaries and podcasts of the day and one of the bro Force squad was saying that they really liked this movie and it is a fun movie but it just didn't help anything with the series of movies it's attached to the mummy three tomb of the dragon emperor yes it's a fun movie but 
it pretty much just crashed uh, any hope of the Mummy series uh, going forward after that. And then several years ago with Tom Cruise, they tried to do a Mummy remake and I heard that was horrible and just pretty much tanked. So I think as far as right now is concerned, the mummy just needs to rest and maybe they can pick it up again later on and do something different with it. Oh gosh, I have to talk about this one. Spider-Man 3 with Tobey Maguire. I liked bits and pieces of this movie. I thought Venom was good. I wish they would have had more Venom and less Sandman in it. I liked the black suited Spider-Man, but also liked the original suited Spider-Man as well. I hated all the lovey-dovey and um, back and forth with Mary Jane and Peter squabbling over stupid things. Uh, I just thought that took away from the movie and then Peter Parker dancing in the street. Yeah, just there was so much wrong with that movie. Yeah, after the greatness that was Spider-Man 1 and then the just the amazing wow factor of Spider-Man 2, you know, everybody was expecting something so great with Spider-Man 3, and it just pretty much crashed everybody's hopes and dreams of what uh, Spider-Man 3 was and where it was going to take the franchise. And after 3, it did not go anywhere. And then we got The Amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield. I liked the first one. I even liked the second one, but a lot of people did not like The Amazing Spider-Man 2. They said it killed The Amazing Spider-Man franchise. Maybe it did. I don't know. I liked the movie. I mean, it had its problems, but uh, for what it was trying to do, I liked it. Then we have a movie that should have never been made, The Fantastic Four from 2015. I loved the first two Fantastic Four films, uh, the ones with uh, Chris Evans as uh, Johnny Storm and, um, oh, I can't think of, uh, uh, Jessica Alba as The uh, Invisible Woman and Michael Chiklis as The Thing. I loved those two, but the one thing that was bad about The Fantastic Four from 2015 is how depressing and dark it was. I just thought the tone was so dark and the mood was so dark that it pretty much just, you know, it didn't help anything to try and get a franchise of Fantastic Four started. It it started with that one and it died with that one and it went nowhere. And I can say the same thing for the next movie that I'm going to talk about, Ryan Reynolds in Green Lantern. There are bits and pieces of Green Lantern that are okay, but the movie and the story itself are just bad. And some of the, even some of the special effects are just bad as well. Then we have Jurassic Park 3 and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So like with the others, pick your poison. Before the Jurassic World part of the series started, a lot of people thought that Jurassic Park 3 was it, that that was the last of Jurassic Park, and a lot of people said that it wasn't as good as the first one or the second movie, and they're right, it's not, but Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom pretty much fell flat on its face, and the story... I don't know. It just felt like we were, you know, in one place on the island and then we take the dinosaurs off the island, which is a stupid idea to begin with. And then we're running around this dark, haunted, huge mansion being chased by dinosaurs. And I was just like, this, no, this shouldn't be happening. This is, they should have done something else. I mean, it just doesn't work for me. So maybe they can clean all that up in Jurassic World Dominion, which is going to be the third movie. I'm not even going to talk about the problems with Jurassic Park 3. There weren't a whole lot, but there were enough to kill the franchise with that one if uh, they hadn't done Jurassic World. There were two that I don't have on my list that I want to talk about. Superman 3 and Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Now, Superman 3 didn't necessarily kill the franchise. It was not a good sequel. They could have done something a lot better. And then after that, they did Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. The thing that killed that one was, you know, they gave over the rights to the canon group uh, from the Salkinds. And then 
they used just these shitty CGI computer graphics and they looked like shit. And the story wasn't that great, but the story was understandable. And Margot Kidder, who plays Lois Lane in those movies, said the execution was bad, she said, but the story they were trying to tell, it was done with good intentions. And I believe that. And I believe the story they were trying to tell was done with the best intentions. It just didn't get executed the way it should have um, to make it stand out on its own and with the, the other two movies. And Christopher Reeve even helped come up with the story uh, for Superman for the Quest for Peace, which is awesome that he got to help write one of Superman's adventures before his accident. The last two we're going to talk about are parts of a franchise, but I don't like to consider them parts of a franchise, but I'm just going to mention these. Uh, these movies should not exist, and in my case, they don't exist. Charlie's Angels 2019 and Ghostbusters 2016. So those are just horrible movies in general. Don't even bother wasting your time with those because they're just pure shit. Okay, and that is it for my chess day. So I hope you all enjoyed what I had to say about these films. Okay, for the second segment, it is the protein shake, which is what is in my cup or what have I watched lately? So when I say lately, I'm going to just kind of spread this out over the course of the last few months um, because I've watched um, a lot of different things, and I'm not going to talk about everything I've watched, just a few things, and, uh, you know, and y'all can just determine if that might be something that you haven't seen or you haven't watched that you might like to watch. So, uh, back in September, I saw a movie that I got on Netflix. I do both the Netflix streaming and I get the DVDs in the mail. And one of the newest ones that I got was the new animated feature film, Scoob, which tells the story of how Scooby and Shaggy met, and then one of their first adventures with uh, Velma, Fred, and Daphne as Mystery Incorporated gets going. And they meet the Falcon crew, the Falcon Fury, and all those fun characters, and solve one of their first big mysteries, and... It just kind of all takes shape from there. Uh, the story is great. The animation is wonderful. Um, I don't remember who the animation company is that did the animation. I do know the film was distributed by Warner Brothers. Uh, but if you haven't seen Scoob and you're a Scooby-Doo fan, or you've watched Scooby-Doo back when you were a child, you ought to give this a try. It's a really, really fun movie uh, for anybody of any age, children and adults alike. And yeah, it's a movie that I enjoy. I may end up buying it one day. Uh, so yeah, check Scoob out. Not a bad film. Then uh, back in September, uh, when movie theaters finally reopened after the big uh, shutdown due to the COVID-19 coronavirus, I went and saw uh, the 40th anniversary of Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, in theaters. Now, I have seen Episode 1, 2, and 3 in theaters. I saw each of those four times, and then I saw uh, Episode 7 four times in theaters. Episode 8 I only watched twice, and then Episode 9 I only watched twice. I have not seen any of the original trilogy until I saw this at the 40th anniversary of this film. So this is the first original, original Star Wars film I saw in theaters, and it was great to see it in theaters because um, I've only seen it on uh, VHS and DVD back when I was growing up. Of course, I have the DVD and Blu-rays now, and uh, I have the box set on VHS and yeah, it it was great looking up on screen. The sound was magnificent. Uh, 
and that's where Star Wars movies belong is on the big screen. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's great to watch them at home on, on TV or on DVD and Blu-ray or streaming or whatever, but uh, this is where movies like like this really thrive is in the movie theater. And I, even though I had seen it God knows how many times, I still thoroughly enjoyed it in the in the movie theater. So Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, here this past week, I watched a film that came out in 2015 based on a true story starring uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt called The Walk. And it was about Philippe Pettit, who was a high wire uh, stunt walker. And uh, back in the 70s, when the World Trade Center was almost finished being built and people were moving in to offices there, he tightrope walked uh, between the two 110-story towers of the World Trade Center. And what a movie it was. I thoroughly enjoy this movie. If you have not seen this movie, I would say it's one of Joseph Gordon-Levitt's best. Uh, I didn't even know it was him uh, in the starring role until after uh, the end credits started rolling because his makeup and his performance was just so amazing and incredible. Um yeah, great film, The Walk. Highly recommend it. A few weeks before that, I watched another movie that was based on a true story called The Impossible, starring Ewan McGregor, Naomi Watts, and a young Tom Holland Spider-Man. It was about the 2004 tsunami that hit uh, Thailand and Southeast Asia. And man, what a story, what a movie. Uh, what incredible effects they used to pull this film off. I mean, it looked real. Uh, this is not like a horror horror movie, like, like the slasher films, but it's its own kind of horror. And how the human spirit thrives and survives in circumstances and situations like this, it really shows you just how strong we as people are so yeah uh, great movie hard movie to watch but uh man uh ewan mcgregor and naomi watts and tom holland pull off uh a plus oscar winning performances in that film this week uh i've been watching the thor movies in fact a few hours ago i just got done watching thor ragnarok so i started last night watching uh, the first Thor, and I wasn't quite ready to go to sleep, so then I watched Thor The Dark World. And so a while ago, like I said, I finished watching Thor Ragnarok, and I like the Thor movies. I think the first one doesn't get the praise it deserves. Um, the second one, a lot of people don't like the second one. I like it uh, for what it is and what it was trying to do. And Thor Ragnarok, uh, it's just... You know, it, it's, it's a great film. It's got humor. It's got wit. It's got emotion. Uh, it's got comic book sci-fi action. It's just got anything and everything. Uh, just a great movie just to pop in and, and enjoy and just, you know, just enjoy it. I mean, the, the Thor movies are meant to be enjoyable, and, and, and I like the Thor movies. Last week, I was watching uh, the Scream movies. I hadn't watched Scream uh, those three films in probably several years and so I just saw them and I was like I'll watch the Scream movies so I started with Scream 1, Scream 2, Scream 3. I don't have Scream 4. I don't like Scream 4. Um, I'll probably watch Scream 4 uh, later on when I decide to do movie reviews on the Scream films but as far as owning Scream 4, uh-uh, not gonna happen. I hate that film. Okay, a lot of you guys are going to think this is kind of weird, and I don't know why I decided to start watching this, but I did. I guess because of all that was happening, it was just such a blur and just incomprehensible when it was happening. Uh, but I found on YouTube, someone had put on the whole like first 24 hours of uh, ABC World News Tonight with Peter Jennings when he was doing the 
coverage for September 11th, 2001, the terror attack coverage from when it began to the next day. And I just spent several days just watching, you know, Peter Jennings report on what was going on, the, you know, the rescue effort, the, uh, you know, just the events of that day. And, um, you know, for what we get now in the media and all the fake news, you know, I, I guess, I, I think if Peter Jennings was still alive, he'd still be doing the, the real news reporting and not what's going on today. And uh, I have so much respect for Peter Jennings and uh, it's sad that we lost him, but damn, he was a, he was a damn good journalist and I miss his, uh, coverage on world news tonight and his reporting and um i started watching a series it only got three seasons i uh, just finished up the first season and i'm probably going to start the second season here pretty soon of designated survivor that's the abc show that starred Kiefer sutherland as the president of the united states and uh, i was a huge Kiefer sutherland fan uh, back in the early 90s with all the films he did then. And then uh, he did that TV show called 24 where he was a federal agent uh, for the counter-terrorist unit. And, oh man, I loved him in 24. And so whenever I saw this, I, I remember when Designated Survivor was on TV, but I never was able to sit down and watch it. And so I'm glad Netflix has it on their streaming services now. And uh, so far, I've enjoyed it. It's a it's a great show. Not as good as Twenty Four, but uh, uh, very new and interesting role to see Keifer Keifer Sutherland in, and he does a damn good job, just like he did with Twenty Four and other TV shows and movies that he's done in the past as well. In May of twenty twenty, the seventh and final season of Marvel's Agents of Shield started. And it was a shortened up season, like season six was, that only had 13 episodes. And um, it ran from May till the first part of August of 2020. And I watched all the episodes as they aired on television. And I must say, it was one of the greatest seasons, and what a great conclusion to such a wonderful show that we got seven seasons of uh i'm gonna miss agent phil colson and all the agents of shield melinda may daisy johnson fitz simmons mac deke yo-yo and anyone else that i'm forgetting um bobby morris and lance hunter uh the koenigs yeah just a great show with great stories and uh that's one part of the Marvel Universe I'm going to miss is Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And uh, if you haven't seen it, you ought to give it a try. It's on Netflix streaming and they've got the DVDs for sale uh, and the Blu-rays as well on Amazon and eBay, which I'll probably buy uh, on both formats. Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it was just... It was great, and it was really something special. It's my all-time favorite TV show. That is my protein shake, what is in my cup, and what I've watched lately. Okay, so for this video, we've reached the third and final segment entitled, Do You Even Lift? And in this segment, I'm going to find a question uh, about movies or television and I'm going to answer the question as best as I possibly can. And so without further ado, here's the question. From any movie or TV show, are there any scenes that you think are underrated or that you consider epic? My answer to that question is yes. And I will give you an example from several movies and a TV show on those scenes. So, in the film Twister that starred Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton, there is a scene, it's about midway through the movie, where they all stop off in Wakita, Kansas at Aunt Meg's house. She's the aunt of Helen Hunt's character, and they're just there to have lunch and just kind of chill out. 
until they get back on the road to chase more tornadoes. And in that scene, they're cooking steak and eggs, and they've got mashed potatoes and real fresh squeezed lemonade. I always thought that scene was underrated because it was a scene that was just so awesome because it's a mouth-watering scene. I mean, it makes you sit there in the theater when you saw this film or if you watched it on television and thought, oh my gosh, that looks so good. I want some mashed potatoes. I want some steak and eggs. I want a glass of that fresh squeezed lemonade. And the way the director utilizes the shots of the food, oh my gosh. It's just, oh man, it's an incredible scene. And every time I watch Twister and that scene comes up, after the scene is over, I'm always craving steak and eggs with mashed potatoes and fresh squeezed lemonade. And, uh, you know, you get the real thing uh, of them, uh, you know, frying it up in the frying pan and, and just, yeah. I mean, they have the works in that scene. And I always thought that scene was underrated just because it showed how great food can be. The next scene is from the first and original Ghostbusters movie. Uh, it's a scene where I'm guessing they're driving back to the Ghostbusters firehouse. It's Ray and uh, Ernie Hudson's character, Winston Zedmore. They're driving uh, down one of the big long extension bridges uh, in New York City and it's got a shot of Ecto-1. And during that scene, uh, they get to talking about, you know, some serious stuff and they kind of just look at each other for a minute and they're just like, how about a little music? And Winston's like, yeah. So this cool beat of instrumental uh, kind of techno music starts up. And as it starts up, uh, we get a shot of the Ecto-1 car on the bridge and uh, what the director does with the camera is he pulls out to reveal a great shot of the New York City skyline with Ecto-1 in the foreground and you just see the entire skyline including uh, the Twin World Trade Towers and I don't care what movie it's in or you know whenever you see a shot like that I always appreciate shots of New York City now uh, before 9-11 when you know they were able to actually show the Twin World Trade Center towers uh, because you know they don't exist anymore unfortunately and so I always considered that an underrated scene and uh, the music makes it quite epic. The next scene comes from Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park and this is just an epic scene because of the great swelling John Williams music uh, that accompanies the scene and it's when they're on the helicopter and they're on the way to the island. I just love that scene as the helicopter approaches the island and goes through the island and gets ready to land and John Williams music just makes it all the more epic. The next scene comes from uh, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice and it's the scene where Bruce Wayne uh, who's played by Ben Affleck is working out and you see him doing all sorts of these uh, different exercises and you see how hard he's working but you also see how much dedication he took to getting in shape for the role I mean he is nothing but solid muscle in that scene he's doing pull-ups with uh, uh, 45 pound plates uh, several attached to him and then he's doing bench presses he's doing uh, some stuff with dumbbells he's uh, pushing this uh, sled thing and he's beating this tire with a sledgehammer I mean man it's just like I mean you can tell in that scene he is all business and he is uh, ready to go to work as Batman just a cool underrated epic scene Okay, my next uh, scene comes from a TV show, uh, which is Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but it's also part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's on uh, 
the uh, Thor DVD uh, for the first Thor movie and the special features. It's like a very short uh, Marvel film and it's Agent Coulson and he's on the way to Thor's Hammer in New Mexico and it's this scene of him stopping in a gas station to get gas for his rental car and then he goes inside and I, I guess he's uh, wanting something sweet so he gets these like uh, packs of li those little white covered donuts and those little chocolate covered donuts and when he's in there looking at which one he wants to get the place is being robbed by these two white guys armed with shotguns and the way Coulson takes them down oh my god so epic I mean you see Coulson in a whole new light and of course you know once he's you know, subdued those guys. He he pays for you know his gas and his uh, little snack that he got, and he's just so you know so calm. And this the lady who's you know working the register is just like you know just looking looking at him like, who are you? You know, <laughs> it's just so great. So if you have the uh, Thor Blu-ray or the Thor DVD, you need to pop it in, go to the special features, and watch the short film of Coulson on the way to Thor's hammer. So, yeah. The next one is from, I believe this uh, movie came out in 2016 uh, called Krampus, and the scene that I'm talking about from that film is where the grandma uh, finally stands up to Krampus and faces her fear uh, from years ago when she encountered him as a child. Uh, you don't get to see what happens, but you just see her finally say, all right, you asshole, you know, enough is enough. And she stands up to him and yeah, just a quick moment, but an epic moment in that film. This scene does not get mentioned. In fact, I've never heard anyone mention this scene in uh, any of Arnold's epic movies or epic moments that he's had from different movies uh, that he's done in the past. And it's when Arnold Schwarzenegger is chasing a terrorist in the film True Lies, and he's on a horse. Like, he's on horseback. <laughs> just a great scene just, oh yeah everything about that is just great epic uh, total Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, one liners when he's on the horse and stuff like that just uh, just great stuff you know the next one is when Sylvester Stallone uh, makes his first appearance as uh, Judge Dredd in the film Judge Dredd um, this film doesn't get mentioned in his uh, biography too much, uh, but it's one of my guilty pleasure films. I love Judge Dredd. I thought Sylvester Stallone uh, did a great job with the Judge Dredd character. And finally, all of the non-violent flashback scenes of Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. Just those scenes in that movie are so underrated. Uh, but epic in their own way. Um, you got the scene of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, uh, the Last Supper. I think there's a scene with uh, Mary. There's a scene where Jesus is, it shows his carpentry skills. He's building a table and chairs. And it also kind of shows uh, the humorous side of Jesus. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, the Passion of the Christ is a great film, um, a hard to watch film. Uh, but I mean, when you talk, you, when you think or talk about that film, your mind is mainly on, you know, what he went through uh, on the cross um, and his scenes that are nonviolent. Uh, the flashback scenes uh, don't get a lot of recognition, and I think they should. Okay. This is the end of this segment and the end of my tribute video to the Bro Force Squad. So I hope you all have enjoyed it and 
to the Bro Force Squad. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I made this video especially for all of you guys. I hope maybe one day to meet you guys in person and then maybe we could collaborate on several things, maybe on my channel or y'all's channel. Um, just uh, keep up the great content, guys. Uh, I think it's great. I love y'all's commentaries. Uh, I love y'all's just uh, random videos about different things. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for all you do, and I hope uh, you really enjoy this video that I made for you. I made it with a lot of heart. It took me a long time, and I put a lot of effort into it. So, anyway, um, I'll end by saying Happy Thanksgiving 2020, Merry Christmas 2020, and Happy New Year 2021. So, this is Wade's Movie World, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.